have any of you had an opportunity to see uh, the Google Glasses yet? Um, they project in your field of vision um, uh, displays, and it'll tell you things like the name of the shop that you happen to be um, passing by, or what direction you're heading, or it tells you things. It's got a facial recognition software running, and so it'll tell you things like the name of the person walking past you. Well, wouldn't it be cool if it also came programmed to do things like uh, tell you the communication preference of the person that you were going to be meeting with? Or if it could tell you something like uh, their, uh, the, the way to best connect with them. Oh my gosh, now that would be a breakthrough in engagement, right? Or guys or gals, you know, whichever way we grow in here. Wouldn't it be cool if there was a um, date or a significant other uh, mood reading detector for you? <laughs> like if I could invent that software, oh my god, I could retire tomorrow. Well, that's the crazy shenanigans that was going through my head when I was thinking about this topic of engage, because like, I'm really hoping to be able to reframe how we actually engage or the conversation around it. But then I got to thinking, I wonder what everybody else wants to hear about. And so in true introvert fashion, I reach out to the masses uh, from the privacy of my own home, of course, <laughs> via Facebook and uh, email and ask 900 of my very closest personal friends, <laughs> family and colleagues for their feedback. Uh, 281 of them responded and uh, they said things like, uh, it broke out into three categories pretty quickly. The word engagement, uh, some of them had things, they asked questions like, uh, so I want some marriage advice, I want to propose, do you have any advice for that? And I was like, well, that makes sense. That's, I would imagine they want to hear something like that. Then the second category was stuck in life, like, um, I feel like I'm in a dead end job, I don't feel very engaged in my life and I would love to hear something along those lines. I thought, okay, that's interesting. Third category must have been like managers or leaders or something because they asked a lot of questions like, uh, how do I deal with my coworkers? How do I engage my boss? How do I engage my team? I'm on a project and I want to engage the, the whole entire project team. How do I engage my company? What about customers? And I was like, okay, those all kind of make sense to me. That's, that's interesting. So I thought, well, I need to ask a couple more questions. The next question I asked was, so why is Engage important to you in your scenario? Well, the comments came back, uh, as you would imagine, things like, um, well, I can't imagine my life without this person. Well, clearly we know that was the Marriage Engage group. <laughs> but then the rest of them came back with things I wasn't really actually expecting. They came back with things like, well, my life is short and I want it to have meaning. Um, I want to do, do as much good as I can while I'm here. Um, I want to enjoy my work life. Um, I want to get promoted. <laughs> and so I thought, well, okay, those, that makes sense too. The next question was, so um, what's stopping you? Well, though there wasn't a whole lot of diversity in that question set that came back. It was, I don't really know what else to do. I feel like I've, I've tried everything. I don't know how else to engage. This is what I've got. It's like, hmm, okay. I think it's good to note just for kind of in your mind, of the last two uh, categories, the second group, the stuck in life group, and then the manager leader group, there were 120 questions that asked, how do I engage X? I thought it was very interesting. Well, I think to unpack this word engage, I think we kind of need to use, a, I think we should use a film, a film that we maybe are hopefully all familiar with. And the film that I'm thinking of is, uh, it goes, um, I feel the need, the need for, ah, except I felt the need for a really good love story, so I went with the notebook. <laughs> we start off this story with Noah, and Noah is a, a simple country boy, hardworking, but Noah has a dream. Noah wants to rebuild the Whitaker Mansion. Well, we find Noah out on this night particularly, and he is going to take off work, and he's heading to the fair with all of his buddies, right? When he sees her, Allie, all of a sudden it all comes into to frame for him. He's just like, oh my gosh, this is the most beautiful girl I've ever seen, right? The only problem is Allie is surrounded by friends and family in this very full social calendar. How is he going to get her attention? Well, very quickly we find out just the kind of man Noah is. He is very uh, singular-minded, singular he is uh, uh, very focused, and uh, very driven to go get what he wants, and he's not going to take no really for an answer necessarily. And we observe that by watching the next four attempts at trying to get a date with her. First time he walks up to her while she's already on a date, while the date is standing next to her to ask her out. 
<laughs> she turns him down. Second time, um, she's on a date. The date is present again. They're on a Ferris wheel. He runs up the Ferris wheel, hangs from the Ferris wheel, and says, I'm not getting down to you. See, you're going out with me. Well, of course she's saying she's going out with you, Dilly. Um, you know, she wants you down off the Ferris wheel. She's on a date. Well, realizing he didn't get very far, he goes up to her again. She, he finds her on the street, and this time he takes the begging, pleading approach. So as we watch this, she's like, we know he's still in the no-fly zone. This date is not happening, right? Well, thank goodness for his friends who take pity on him and uh, set him up for a double date. Well, Noah must be doing something good because uh, they end up ditching this other couple that they're with, and they go out and they start strolling Main Street. They start talking quite a bit. Noah does really one smart thing, and he's listening very carefully for what really matters to Allie. He's watching her life and what she's talking about, and very quickly he realizes this girl's pretty high strung, and if I'm gonna, if I stand a chance here, I need to make sure she's having a whole lot of fun. So that's exactly what he does. He takes her out and they proceed to have a ton of fun, right? So he is like making sure he's adding value to her life and things are going well. They're sharing hopes, they're sharing dreams to where their, their relationship goes to the point where he finally feels like he can share his biggest dream. He takes her out to the Whitaker Mansion and he tells her, oh, this is, this is what I wanna do. Well, not surprising, she buys into it, right? She's like, oh my gosh, yes. I can see this house with us in it. I think we should paint it white. And I think we should have blue shutters. And I, and I want an art room in the back that overlooks the river. And, and I want a big wraparound porch where we're gonna sit and we're gonna have tea together and we're gonna watch our kids. This sounds like a couple in love to me, right? Well, but sadly, through a bunch of unfortunate circumstances, these two are separated for a very long time. They finally start to live their own lives and, and head their own direction. And uh, Noah ends up going off to the war. Allie ends up becoming a nurse. And when he comes back, he goes to try to find her, only to find that she is now engaged to someone else. Heartbroken, he returns back, and he starts in on rebuilding this, this mansion that he'd promised. Well, he finishes the mansion, and the big city newspaper uh, catches wind of it, and they come out to do a really big feature article on it. The whole feature article ends up in the newspaper. The newspaper ends up in Allie's fitting room when she's being fitted for her wedding gown. She opens it up. She can hardly stand it. She sees that he delivered. He completed the thing that they talked about. She leaves immediately because she has to go back to find out, is there anything between us? Well, we know that there certainly is something still left between them. Quite a bit of passion is left between them. And we know that uh, he does go on to finish the mansion. We see it beautifully and that they are reconciled. Well, we can pause the movie here for just a second because we can pull out very quickly just the basic steps for how to engage. The basic steps to how to engage is very quickly, you need to get somebody's attention. And it, you gotta work pretty hard to get their attention, right? Second thing you can call out pretty quickly is once you have their attention, uh, you gotta create a lot of positive emotion to keep that attention going, right? Or the engagement going. Then you gotta be able to add a lot of value, and then you wanna be able to make sure that you deliver on the thing that you promised them. Well, I got to thinking about it, and I was like, well, that's pretty simple. Those are fairly easy steps. I don't understand why the group would have had all those questions, how do I? And I thought, oh, there, there's got to be more. We're missing something. And then I got to thinking about it. How do I engage? Wait a minute. The question was engage. Engage led to meaningful life. I want to do good work. How do I engage others? I was like, oh, there it is. Okay, I, I see what's going on. We're asking the wrong question. How do I engage others? This isn't a question that actually leads us into action to creating a meaningful life. The question we have to ask ourselves is, am I engaging? If we ask ourselves, am I engaging? Well, that gives us a whole different framework, a different set of lenses to use to find out, oh my gosh, what's going on? If people aren't engaging with me, what am I doing? What's going on with me? And so taking just a moment to pause and find out, I'd like for us to take a look inside for just a second. And I believe there's a few power sources, if you will, inside, places we can look that actually help us become more engaging. And the very first place I wanna talk about is this, who am I? And why am I here? I think when we run into people who know who they are and why they're here, they're absolutely electrifying when they, when they are. And I don't mean like they're extroverts, and I don't mean they're charismatic. I mean there is just something so real about them. And you immediately kind of know, 
oh, that, that person's a real deal. You can sense it about them. This business of who I am consists of understanding my strengths, my talents, and my values. This business of purpose is understanding what it is that I'm, I want to do here on the face of this earth. We see that Noah had this real strong compulsion. He wanted to, to rebuild this mansion, really, in a bad, bad way. That was his thing. Well, what you don't see till the end of the movie is that they actually transformed it, or transformed it into an elderly home for people with dementia. So it actually, his, his vision transformed not just to be this, become this house, but to serve the greater good. I think it's very interesting when we talk about this business of Engage that um, uh, it's the Academy for Positive Psychology did a lot of research and they found that 80% um, of us um, don't feel engaged or connected to our sense of purpose. That number also closely translates to what they found out about happiness. That 73% of the people who feel like when they're connected to their purpose, they actually report themselves being happier. Well, that sounds kind of like a fluffy figure, happiness. What are we really talking about here? That doesn't have a, lot, a whole lot of weight. Well, that is until the National Institute of Health picked up that study and ran it even further and found out that those people that are also happier, well, they're 23% healthier and they live 60% longer than the rest of us who aren't, or those people who aren't feeling connected. Well, now that becomes something to pause and take a look at, right? The next place we want to take a look at is a meaningful contribution. And what we mean by meaningful contribution is this. It's this business of knowing what I'm good at and doing work that I love. I love my job. I love the work that I'm doing. But then there's one thing we've got to add to it. I love the work that I'm doing, and I can also see the good that it's doing in the world. I love what I do, and I can make the connection I see the good that it's doing in the world. There is a Portuguese fable, and it goes like this. There are three bricklayers, and they are out working on a very large project. And they are uh, approached by a gentleman who's on the street, and he asks them. He walks up to the first one, and he says, uh, what are you doing? And the bricklayer looks at him, and he says, stacking one brick on top of another. Oh, OK. He goes up to the next one. What are you doing? He says, making 16 bucks an hour. Back to work. He goes up to the next one. What are you doing? And he says, I'm building a cathedral. It's about to become the house of God. Well, I am supposed to argue with you that only one of those people knew their purpose. The problem with that for me is I've worked with all ages and stages in the workforce, and what I've noticed is when you first enter the workforce, let me tell you something, you feel pretty good about knowing. I understand how the bricks fit together and I'm doing a good job. You feel really good about that, right? <laughs> well, and then when you start to make more money doing it because you're pretty good at it, well, you feel really, really good about that too, right? The thing I'm asking for you to stretch around is then being able to connect that to seeing the good in the world, the way you're contributing to the good in the world and what you're up to. So I think all three of them are actually very important and viable and reasonable to think about. All right, so then if we move on from there, then relationships. Again, I love the positive um, psychology movement that's out right now. They're telling us things like, for us to feel happy and healthy, and once again, we know the numbers around happy and healthy, that we actually need to have four to seven um, really robust friendships around us that help us kind of ride the tide of the highs and lows to get the emotional support and to give the emotional support we need. That leads us to the last one, execution. Now this one, this one's a little harder to kind of walk through. This business of execution, we often just say, or I say when I'm talking about it, is you're doing it. Well, what exactly are you doing? Well, you're doing the hard work of making the choice to live like this, which is um, knowing who I am, knowing what I'm up to, connecting it to doing a job that I love, and then being really purposeful about finding meaning in that work. So you, execution is making a choice to kind of go through that process over the long haul. And we see that Noah was really, really good about that. Even though he had went through a lot of ups and downs in his life, he still found that thing that he wanted to do. Even though he didn't have Allie with him, he walked it through and, and carried it on out the door. Well, the reason I keep pushing this business of finding the good is because I have a very specific belief or lens that I'm hoping that we can look at engagement through. By looking at ourselves, the belief that we become more engaging people when we choose to look at who am I and what do I want to do in this world and what's the good I want to contribute. Because I think that's when you become electric. I, th I think that's when people are actually really pulled um, and uh, 
attracted to what you're doing and what you're up to. I think when we have to ask the question, how do I engage others? It's actually that we're disengaged from our own lives. And then if we bridge that gap and are focused more inward about that kind of stuff, it actually ends up to us playing or doing the good in the world. And why that matters is when you're engaged and you're doing the good in the world, I believe you can do anything. I'd like to leave you with the last two lines from Allie and Noah. Allie, at the very end, she asks Noah, Noah, do you think our love can take us out of here together? And Noah says, Allie, I think our love can do anything. And that's what I believe about us choosing to engage in this lifestyle, is that when we do, we do good, and that good can do anything. Thank you.